Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Alexandra Blaney. I'm the director of production at Shine Global, and I'm also the producer of Virtually Free. And I'm Susan McLaurie, co-founder and executive director of Shine Global. Uh, for accessibility purposes, I'm white, I have gray hair, and I wear glasses. And for accessibility purposes, I am a white woman. My brown hair is in a braid, and I'm wearing a blue shirt. Uh, before we get started with our panelists, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about how this works. Um, the chat box is where you can ask your questions, so please go ahead and say hi in the chat box right now. Let us know where you're tuning in from. If you get an error with the live stream connection, just refresh your page and then rejoin the live stream. And I just want to let you know that this session is being recorded. So if you can't rejoin the stream for any reason, you can log back in after it's over um, and watch both the film and the recording through the end of April. Uh, Homefront was a very personal filmmaking journey for our team, uh, many of us having family in the military or being uh, children of veterans. Um, so we are grateful to Sesame Workshop and HBO Max in allowing us to tell these stories. And I also want to thank Marilyn DeLuca for helping to put this panel together with us. We're happy to welcome you to this conversation about our film and the clinical needs of military children, which is so appropriately timed for April, the month of the military child. For those of you who may not know much about us, Shine Global is a nonprofit media company which gives voice to children and families whose stories of resilience raise awareness, promote action and inspire change. Our efforts are largely supported through generous donations of persons like yourselves. Our moderator today is Dr. Charles Marmer, the founder of the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Center, director of its post-traumatic stress disorder program, and um, chair of the Department of Psychiatry at NYU's Grossman School of Medicine. He is joined by our panelists, these include Dr. Carl Castro, professor and director of the military and veterans programs at the School of Social Work at the University of Southern California. Uh, he is, uh, Dr. Castro is a retired colonel. Uh, Dr. Tracy Neal Walden, also a colonel retired, is chief clinical officer at the Cohen Veterans Network, Falls Church, Virginia. Dr. Amanda Spray is the director of the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at NYU Langone Health and clinical associate professor and director of psychology for the Department of Psychiatry at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. And finally, we have Dr. Amy Williams, who is the chief clinical officer of the veterans organization Headstrong. We welcome you all, and I'll turn this over to you, Dr. Marmer. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> It's a great pleasure and uh, just introduce myself very briefly. Um, I'm a white male with graying hair and endless passion and enthusiasm for the health and wellness of veterans and their families. Dr. Castro. Uh, hello, I'm Carl. Uh, I am a 60 year old male. I wear glasses and I would just like to say I'm better looking in person. And we'll stop there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amanda Spray. I am a psychologist by training. Um, for accessibility, I am a white woman with blonde hair wearing a navy shirt. Hi, I'm Tracy Neal Walden. Uh, for and I'm a clinical psychologist and an Air Force veteran. For accessibility purposes, I'm an African-American woman wearing blue glasses and a black jacket. Wonderful, Amy. And hi, I'm Amy Williams, and I'm also a clinical psychologist at Headstrong and um, and the chief clinical officer. I'm very invested in the work that's being done here because the, the family and the kids are really, at the end of the day, um, what's gonna be our future. And for accessibility purposes, I am a white female with brown wavy hair and I'm wearing a black blazer with a scarf. 
Wonderful. I think we can get started. Welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have a chance to talk about the, the uh, groundbreaking work of Shine Global and the, the kind of heartwarming uh, narratives of the children who have uh, confronted and managed the challenge of uh, living their life and uh, sharing their journey in military families in which uh, one of their deployed parents has suffered some, to some degree the visible or invisible wounds of war. Let me open up the panel discussion by asking you, um, it's been my observation as someone privileged to care for war fighters and their families for several decades now, that given the unique stresses that confront military families, of which there are many, um, military families, the children uh, and adolescents and military families are remarkably resilient overall. What do you think accounts for the resilience of, of our military uh, children and teenagers in the face of their many challenges? And Carl, maybe I'll ask you just to kick off the conversation about that. Well, there's so many things that make uh, military children resilient, but let me just say it, it's, it's part of the culture of, of the parenting. And so children are resilient because they have parents who are resilient and who encourage sort of independence. And I mean independence very broadly. I, I'm gonna stop there and let the other uh, panelists talk, but I think one of the most important things is the, the culture that the military fosters both from the service member perspective. And I think that permeates the entire family structure. Right, so uh, one of the first things that I learned, Carl, about resilience in warfighters is that, it, that the teamwork, the esprit de corps of being a member of the military family gives enormous shared strength. And I wonder, Amy, what, what your thoughts and observations are uh, about how esprit de corps plays its role, not just on the battlefield, but on the home front. I, I think that it, it comes down to, as I think Carl was mentioning too, culture and identity. And if you, if you look and you work with these families, um, one of the first things as a therapist that I really have enjoyed doing is talking about that shared identity and culture um, and really helping to encourage it. And you could really see it in the film, um, the pride that these kids had um, in the identity that they shared of having um, a parent who was serving. And I think that um, it's something that other kids can wrap their head around too, that I think we do pretty well in this country, that when kids are able to, to lead with that and say that, there's a lot of support in our country right now. It hasn't always been that way, but right now, a lot of support, I think, for those kids and pride in that identity. Wonderful. Tracy, what, what are your thoughts from, from inside and outside from uh, the, the military family structure? But what have been your observations, the unique challenges, and the, uh, the, the remarkable strength and resilience of our military families? I think one of the unique challenges that, that I recognize throughout this uh, video, excuse me, I'm recovering from a, call, a cold, <coughs> was the child functioning as a caregiver. And so for many of the individuals, the parents who are experiencing or who have are suffering from the results of a traumatic brain injury, they have to lean on their children to provide additional support. So that is an additional burden on that child. But as Carl mentioned, um, because of the culture, the child is, is raised to be a bit more resilient and there's that sense of community. On the other side, as a retiree, I do see that sometimes that sense of community is lost once the member trans transitions out of the military and they're no longer on a military installation. And so that's one of the areas where I think there needs to be additional support to those family members of, of veterans um, and, and retirees. Wonderful. So one of the stress points is the transition 
from military life to civilian life, which can be very complex and require, I think requires a lot of thought and consideration of how to engineer a soft landing for that transition, uh, given how powerful the shared military experience has been prior to that separation. And I suppose another is at times uh, of frequent moves with even inside the military, where there is some understandable disruption of social bonds and supports, even while, while families are still active duty, not in civilian life. Amanda, uh, you've had the great privilege of uh, directing our, our Cohen Military Family Clinic at NYU and, uh, and caring for many of not just our war fighters, but, but their families as well, uh, all, all kinds of programs, marital therapy programs, family therapy programs, even for children whose parents might have elected not to come to the clinic, which is remarkable. But what are your thoughts about um, what accounts for the unique strengths of our military children? Absolutely. You know, it's been such an honor in the Military Family Center to see the resilience of these children, of these military kids. And I echo everything uh, that's been already said on the panel. And one area that really, I think, was highlighted in the film that we see quite a bit at the center as well is the children benefiting from the mental health services that the parents have received. And I think that really um, allows the child to even be more resilient, having their parents talk about their feelings, encouraging their children to talk about their feelings. Sometimes we'll see a, a couple, well, a military couple will come to us for couples therapy and we'll also interact with the child, whether it's a family meeting or in therapy for the child, and we'll see the child picking up on some of the language that's encouraged in couples therapy, really talking about increased attachment, enhanced, enhanced connections and bonds. And that's really neat to see that the interventions used for the adults in the family really can trickle down nicely to the children as well. Wonderful, thanks. Uh, one of the issue, clear issues that is a challenge for military families and a challenge to some civilian corporate families where there's frequent moves. I had the chance to, to uh, consult with a family in which uh, one of the parents was in the oil industry and was required to move not just from city to city, but country to country. That was in the civilian sector. And that created significant uh, challenges for the children in terms of their, their, their childhood friendships and bonds and schools. What are your thoughts? We live in an age of, of dramatic developments in technology and social media and social connectivity. In what way does technology play a role in helping knit us all back together, including in the military, when we're frequently uh, required to separate from our, from our, our friends and, and uh, teachers and other schoolmates because of moves? Well, what are your thoughts about um, the role of technology? Carl, maybe I know you've been thinking about this problem and have consulted on it. Well, you, you know, technology, you can, there are tremendous advantages to technology. Uh, this, this panel discussion is an example of that, uh, where it allows us to share ideas and, and be connected visually, auditorily, but things that it can't do is it, it, it's not a substitute for a hug. It's not a substitute for a pat on the back, putting your arm around someone. And, and children need those kinds of tactile and, audit, and, and uh, auditory uh, stimulations. And, you know, children love to sit on adults. Anyone who's been around a child who's five years and younger, they'll just come and sit on you because they like to, the, the tactile, and you miss that. That you can't really replicate with technology, but it does allow you to stay connected to friends when you're moving a lot, right? So it allows you to sort of stay involved in people's lives, but it's not a complete substitute. So we need to sort of, you know, how do you, you know, there's this wonderful concept that, that, uh, I, I heard about when I was in the army, it's called loving at a distance. So how do you maintain intimacy 
and these very strong emotional connections at a distance. And technology can help us get there, but it's no substitute for being together in the same room and experiencing everything at the same time. Amanda, technology is so interesting in, in, in its role in family life. And, and Carl uh, has talked about this idea, which I, I think is a fantastic idea about love or affection at a distance how we can maintain loving bonds through, through technology and social connectedness through, through all the social media platforms, which is actually pretty amazing. But technology is not simple and technology has complicated the lives of children and adolescents, both in the military culture and in civilian life. In, in your work with military families, do you see both sides of that issue? Do you see the, the, the incredible benefits of connectivity through, through, so, through, through social media and technology, but do you see strains and challenges? The reason I ask that is I was, re yesterday I happened to be surfing around through the news as I was traveling back from a family vacation in Florida, and I read a startling statistic, which was very interesting, that for the first time in America, the number one public health problem among children and adolescents is anxiety and depression. And uh, previously it had been alcohol and drug misuse, now replaced by, by anxiety and depression. And some of that was attributed to technology and social media. What are your thoughts about that? Certainly, you know, I think this is an area where there's a lot of nuance to it, and it's certainly not all or nothing. We often talk about this topic in the center quite a bit amongst therapists, whether we're working with kids or adults, it, it doesn't really matter. Is there a way to use social media and technology? We sort of say between us um, for good rather than evil. How do we utilize what it what it brings us and what it allows us to do and the connection that we can have that otherwise we might not be able to have without allowing it to overtake us and become too absorbed in technology to the point where it becomes a substitute for the person to person interaction that Carl was referencing right, so how do we allow it to fill in spaces where maybe we'd be completely disconnected in that moment while not allowing it to take over the in-person interactions. And I think this is a particularly important topic right now to be considering given the two plus year pandemic that we've all been living through. I think it's been particularly challenging in some ways for military families. Um, so I think it presents obviously a lot of opportunity, but also some real challenges that we need to be careful about. Tracy, what are your thoughts about the mixed blessing of technology and social connectedness in the military, but maybe in society more broadly? Yes, I, I agree with both Carl and, and Amanda. Um, and I think that technology should be complementary. Uh, you know, I, I'm also, in addition to being a psychologist and a, a veteran, I'm also a mom of a teenager um, who uses technology quite a bit. And there are often a lot of miscommunications with their friends with technology because you know an email or a text doesn't necessarily come across the same way as a face-to-face -face conversation mm -hmm. and so i think it you know it's it's a great way to stay connected especially with their friends who are in other states because we've moved across the country multiple times but there still needs to be that face-to-face -face conversation and just getting outside and engaging in activities uh, is important as well. And I think the more that a child does that, you know, it's it's almost like exposure therapy, exposing them to those environments that over time do create some anxiety because they've lost touch with doing those things. Wonderful, Amy. Uh, what is your experience? Then are we are we ahead with technology? Um, obviously, it has a very special role in military life. Uh, even might even talk about. Have you all thought about the role of distant communications when a parent is deployed to a war zone or on some other deployment 
um, the ability to maintain closer contact with the family during those periods of separation. You know, in World War II, the communication was, was with occasional letters. Now the communication can be in real time by video links. How has that changed military life? That is such an interesting, like you, you took me to a different place than where I was thinking I was going to go. But like when we worked with couples and you talk about our families and you talk about what that communication was like, like when the service member was deployed and w- what you also hear, like it's, it's great, right? Because you get to, you get to see them and you can be connected in a way that you didn't used to be. And it can really help build relationships, but it has a flip side to it because um, it's, kind of, it's asynchronous, right? So the person that's deployed may have just come in from, you know, um, doing a patrol or something really uh, that they were exposed to something really, um, really disturbing, stressful. And even though it might be really helpful to talk to the family, that might be comforting at some level. They're trying to process like, okay, I need to have a barrier here. I don't want you to have to, to know exactly what I'm going through. That's hard. I don't want you to be worried about me. I don't want you to stress about me. But then their partner on the other side gets on and they're like, well, you're never going to believe the mess that I'm having over here with my, you know, 10 year old, um, you know, getting in a fight at school, et cetera. And so they're bringing in kind of the stress of the home front. Right. And then trying to, how do you, um, you can't parent when you're thousands of miles away very effectively in the way you would, if you were there or provide support in that way. So it actually has caused a lot of stress for families to be able to kind of like drop in out of their lives, connect, and then try to make that really helpful. And um, so it's it's a mixed blessing, right? Because then that person goes back, maybe they had a stressful call back home, maybe there's relationship issues going on, then they have to go back out and get back into mission mindset. So I think um, it's a blessing and a curse. And I honestly think that our whole world is catching up with technology versus technology catching up with us. We we haven't quite um, kept up to speed with, with the the rapid growth of technology in our lives. So it's an ongoing thing. And maybe 50 years from now, I'll be able to say something smart about it. But right now I just know it's good and it's bad. I I think that's pretty smart to begin with. We we don't have to wait 50 years. We can just wait five minutes for the next question for you, Amy, and we'll get more pearls of wisdom. But that's very, very interesting what you were saying about in, in the communication between military families and their deployed parent or sibling or other family member, it's not just the stressful news from, from the, the, the theater of war that's coming back to the family. It's the stresses of everyday family life, which can be very considerable and maybe greater when, when a parent's deployed, coming to the war zone. Uh, it reminded me, uh, in my work earlier in my career, I was working with NASA to help uh, develop programs to build resilience and wellness in astronauts and cosmonauts in preparation for the mission to Mars with a colleague of mine, Dr. Nick Canis from from UCSF where I was at the time. And one of the difficult things for, for astronauts and cosmonauts when they're circling the globe for six months, 12 months, is to get hear news of family problems, a child falls ill, a teenager crashes a car, there are financial problems, whatever the, the, the everyday problems of family life, when they come up to you at a distance where you don't feel you can directly intervene, that can be very challenging for, for the parent who's deployed in that situation. How do they, how do they manage that? Uh, what kind of support is given to, the, to those who are deployed to be able to help manage the stress of not being there to care as much on a day-to-day basis for their family when they're in the war zone. Carl, have you, have you thought about that problem? You know, you it, 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 this maybe isn't the, um, an answer to that question, but it highlights that the partner or the spouse of a service member has to be totally independent to handle all of these things on their own. We don't talk about this a lot in the military and probably most husband and wives and partners don't realize that you're basically gonna be a single parent. You're gonna have to sort all this out yourself. And you know that causes a real uh, challenge for some because the service member still wants to be engaged and 
you know, the serviceman's got to turn all the finances over to to the spouse, and and that's just it. And they've got to make all these tough decisions on the ground in real time. I loved Amy's comment about these decisions are made are asynchronous, right? I had to make a decision like when it happened, I couldn't wait to consult with a service member who was deployed or someone who's on the Mir space station somewhere. Decision had to be made. Purchases had to be made. Plumbing needed to be fixed, you know, so all of these things, and it makes a lot of young men and women very nervous knowing that their partner's making all of these, some of these really big decisions without their input. But that's the culture of the military, which makes it so challenging. And we don't really talk about that a lot that, you know, because usually when people get married, they like each other and they want to be around each other. But the military, part of the culture is we separate you for long periods of time sometimes, a year, longer than a year. And so it's like, how do you do that? Of course, the family has lots of resources they can draw on, um, but you know, at the same time, you, you don't want to seem needy, right? You want to sort of show that you're an independent person and you can make these decisions, but it's really difficult. I always think that what the military uh, spouse, the data we should be comparing them to are single parents because that's what they are in a lot of cases. <laughs> They're single parents. And and we don't you know like to say it that way, but I think it, the data gives us more insight, if that makes sense. But I'll you know I'll stop there and leave, let the rest of the panel jump I, in. On. I, I think that's totally fascinating. And in fact it, it's so important that those kinds of stresses um, uh, not just being a single parent, but maybe having to adjust to being a single parent and not a single parent in, in kind of random intervals. And how do you make all those transitions? Those stresses can be as great sometimes as the stresses of adjusting to an injury which may occur in, in the war zone. I think sometimes because we're in the field, all of us of dealing with traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury and so on, we sometimes forget that the everyday stressors of life can be enormously powerful and sometimes more difficult to cope with than the specific stresses involved around a traumatic incident where someone may have been lost in the war zone, a friend or someone may have been injured. Those are very, very important, but we, I think we should not forget about these powerful social stressors which occur simply by the separation. Other panelists, what are your thoughts about the unique experience of being a, a parent separated either on the home front or to be the war fighter away for a long period of time and struggling with how to maintain a close sense of intimacy and connection with the family while managing their duties uh, while separate. I'm really yeah, glad. I'm... Amanda. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Tracy. Sorry about Tracy. that. Tracy. I would add that it really involves a lot of communication between those partners, because as Carl stated, the one partner becomes a single parent. Um, and so you have to trust your partner in order to give over all of the finances and trust them to make decisions. And so, but that requires a lot of communication beforehand and then, you know, follow up communication throughout. Uh, and then there's also that transition of when the individual comes back, because the military member may be gone 9, 10, 12 months uh, or, or longer on a deployment, and then they come back in. And so it's important for them to, to provide support to this single parent spouse who has been taking care of things while they've been gone. But they also need to check in with them and do it at, at their pace. Prior to coming back from my deployment, my husband shared with me, he said, you're not gonna come back and just take over everything. And, I was, and that was a, a wake up call for me. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I just sort of like played it by ear and did what he needed me to do and what my children needed from me in order to reacclimate back into their lives. And that's, that's a piece that I think many people don't think about. That military member then has to reacclimate into their family's lives post-deployment. 
I think that's incredibly important. My, my uh, warfighter patients often say that's one of the biggest challenges. And my astronaut and cosmonaut colleagues would say that, that, the fam that while they're gone for a year, the family system, as Carlos said, has to reorganize itself around the culture of a single parent family. That parent carries enormous responsibility, but then they create this new structure, which is functioning. And then the, the other parent comes back and there's like, you know, it's like basketball under the getting an offensive rebound is you have to throw, how do you fight your way back into the game when you've been sealed off and the system is working and it's like, you're, you're almost like a new kid on the block again. I think your husband gave you great advice to do that with a light touch and not, not to come bulldozing back. In. But what, what are your thoughts about that? Amanda, you were, you wanted to add to that also. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about sort of the re-entry of the veteran or the service member into the family unit. We see this quite a bit at the center as well. Maybe the child is the identified patient at the time, and they're coming in with whether it be behavioral outbursts at school or some, some other problematic behavior, and we bring the whole family in, right? Because it's usually systemic. It's usually something that's going on with the whole family unit, and we find that there was a, a veteran or a service member who's newly back in the the home. And I think amongst civilians, uh, or the, particularly those that don't work with veterans or might not have the military cultural competency, I think there is a romanticized view of what reunification as a family might look like after a deployment. And I think um, the reality is what we're talking about, right? It's a challenge and it's a new transition. And that can sometimes trickle down to, to kids. Sometimes kids are the, the canary in the coal mine. Sometimes the kids are the ones that it, it first shows up in. Um, when there's some sort of adjustment difficulty going on in the family. So I'm, I'm really glad we're, we're talking about this. And I really like how it, how it came up in the film as well. of uh, sort of like, you know, what are these kids going through and, and where could that be coming from? And then how's the family adjusting and what's the family doing about it? And I really appreciated that for uh, the civilian audience to see as well, to learn a little bit about the, the military families and, and their unique, really unique um, experience. Amazing. Amy, what are your thoughts? This is such, a, such an important issue. And well, I, think, I think it doesn't get discussed enough in, in, uh, among military family clinics and among health, mental health care workers supporting our, our, our military and veterans, we, maybe we don't give enough thought to the, the, the rhythms of military life and the comings and goings and the separations and the reunions. They, they are, it seems profoundly important. Well, you know, I think that um, one of the things that, you know, if you're not in the military community, you might not know, there are, are these family readiness groups and, and you know, there, there's a lot of talk about like the transition of getting ready for deployment and what do you do right after. But I think the thing that this film really um, did a nice job on, and I don't know that, that this is true of every military family, but I, I think it's something to aspire to. The level of emotional intelligence and communication that was happening in these families was amazing. Whether it was coming from the parent um, the appropriate level of sharing. Um, I love the use of the book um, to, to teach kids, like, here's what your parent might have gone through or is going through, or, you know, and there's some really good resources out there for that, of, of really upping the game on, we're all going to be here on the same page. And not like what was Amanda was talking about with families, a lot of times when they're presenting for therapy, they're not. And so the job of the clinician is like, well, let's figure out where this kind of went sideways. Let's get back on the same page. But once you do that, and you start attending to the attachment in, in the families and the relationships, um, I find that families have a really powerful sense of being able to heal themselves in a lot of ways. But I think what the therapist can do and what mental health experts can do is how do we get you on that track? How do we tell you how to get there? How do we give you the tools to where you can start doing that? And some of the things that this film depicted were just spot on and made me smile. Wonderful. Um one of the questions that, that we touched on earlier, uh, and this is for any of the panel members who would like to uh, comment on this, is there, there are lots and lots of challenges 
of military family life, particularly at times of war uh, and other high security times when, when the strains are great on our expeditionary forces and maybe repeatedly redeployed, given that we have a limited number of people who serve our country and make these enormous sacrifices. It's tough on the families. Uh, but, but at the same time, the military, when you're, you're, you are a member of a military family, you are not just a member of your family, you're a member of the family of the military, which is a gr enormous collective experience and part of identity. What happens when, uh, as, as you have done uh, after your distinguished service, separate, uh, all, uh, Carl, Tracy, and you, Amy, uh, have separated from the military um, and entered civilian life. What's the impact on family life at that time? That's a good question, Charlie, and it goes back to what I mentioned a little bit earlier in terms of that sense of community. And so one of the things that the family often loses is the sense of community, and that's why it's really important for that for there to be a smooth transition and for them to get connected with resources. Resources like, you know, some of us in, in the room from, you know, Cohen Veterans Network, Headstrong, there are lots of other resources such as Blue Star Families, uh, the Avalon Network has programs for individuals who, uh, whose family member may have suffered a, a traumatic brain injury, um, as well as the Shepherd Center, but the key is for them to be connected with those resources. And I think that's where, that's where the difficulty lies. And there's a huge gap. When an individual is on active duty, they, they know the different offices to go to, to get connected with resources. But once they transition, it becomes more difficult. And so it's really important that, those, that the individuals and those families are made aware of those resources. You know, uh, I, and earlier in my career, what, one, of the, one of my responsibilities, which I uh, greatly enjoyed and was very formative in my own professional identity, I was chief of psychiatry at the San Francisco VA hospital at uh, Fort Miley in, in the Bay Area. And uh, when I started my work there, I had transitioned from working with civilian trauma at the university, UCSF, to, to transitioning to work with, with veterans, uh, mostly veterans, not so much active duty at Fort Miley. Uh, one of the things I, I, I was sort of perplexed with at first was how deep the attachment of, our, of my veterans' patients were to each other in our groups. In fact, it, it only came out later that before one of my groups told me only a year into group therapy that the best part of the group therapy with me was the lunch they had together before they came to the hospital. They went to this great burger joint, uh, which was close by Fort Miley, and they had burgers and fries and they kind of talked or what they say bullshitted about their military experiences. And the, that, that, the, the, that the despite my delusions of grandeur of being a great therapist, they said most 85% of the help they got was from that. And then, they, oh, and by the way, we come to see you because we're in your group also, Dr. Marmer. So uh, I, that was a sobering and interesting experience, but the, it was very important. And they said it was kind of symbolically recreated their, their combat unit for them. And they were very, very close to each other and really cared about each other having been deployed uh, all separately. Carl, what are your thoughts about that, about how, how people maintain a military identity in their civilian life? Well, you know, when you were talking, it, it reminded me of the children in the film who children need to be around other children too, just like service members need to be around other service members or other veterans because they have that shared experience and it comes back to something Amy said a shared experience is only shared if it happens at the same time not if you hear about it later yeah I now know about the experience but it's not a shared experience and and so it's 
it's, you know, children need to be around other children. And, and something that, that Amanda said also just struck me and also Tracy is the children had a vocabulary to talk about things. And I cannot stress the importance enough with children in particular to provide them that vocabulary because you can't express yourself if you don't have a language. That's one of the things that we learned very early on in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan is veterans, not veterans, active duty soldiers and Marines lacked a vocabulary to describe how they were feeling. And, and so a lot of it is just developing a vocabulary, this shared vocabulary in order to express how you're feeling. And the reason why you wanna be around people with shared experience is to normalize you, right? Having a shared experience and being around, but the ch children need to see like, well, is my family that different, right? Amer you know, the human being is very good at doing comparisons. Usually we're very good at, com uh, at identifying disparities or when I'm not getting my fair share. But also the comparison is, oh, we're not as screwed up as everybody else or as most people, you know, we're not perfect, but you know, we're not that bad. So comparisons are really, really helpful. And you can only get those by having truly shared experiences. So. Yeah. Uh, it it's really interesting. And it's really interesting how veterans groups kind of knit that together because to your point, Carl, they didn't actually share the, the most um, traumatic or challenging moments together in the war zone. They were all deployed in different units at different times, but somehow in the magic of these groups they created as veterans, they recreated that experience and almost made it a shared experience together. They sort of time traveled together in the group therapy back into those experiences together. It was, very, it was like a virtual redeployment or something. I'd never conceived of it that way at the time, but I think that something like that was really, was really going on. They kind of had each other's back in this virtual shared narrative of the group therapy. It was fascinating. And I would just add, add that, oh, I'm sorry, Amy, but just very quickly is one of the reasons veterans like to be around other veterans is we don't have to talk about a lot of things because you get it. You've been there. So I don't have to explain everything I've been through because you've been through it too. So that's again where like shared experiences brings you together because I don't need to talk about what I did in Iraq or Afghanistan or what I did in the army or basic training, because you were there, you know what it's like. I can just make a comment and you get it immediately without a lot of explanation. And, and veterans like that. We like talking and code to each other to see how well you know, you're connected to what we're saying. So I'm sorry, Amy, please jump in. Well, no, I, I, I wanted to just add to that actually, that you know that's such a gift when you have that community that you can tap into. For that strength, we know that when you're tapped into community, you're more resilient and you're stronger. I think what's interesting is the, the CIVMEL divide in this moment, that divide between you've got such a small percentage of the country that serves and our reserve and guard component has gotten even bigger. And a lot of times that reserve and guard component live away from a base, away from that community. And so now you've got that the active duty or even the veteran is removed from that culture and their kid doesn't see similar families and they're going to school and Tracy, I don't want to out you here, but they're going to school with maybe civilian teachers, administrators who don't understand how to support the kids. And I think that's a growth area for us as a, as a country is better educating our educators who have that frontline experience with those kids to support their experience. You know, Amanda has been passionate about that point based on our experience of uh, consulting with the teachers at Fort, uh, where the kids from Fort Hamilton go to school. It's been a wonderful experience, actually. Uh, just before we get back to you, Tracy, as well, we have an audience question I wanted to read to all of you. And uh, this, this uh, participant would like to hear all of your impressions uh, and advice. The question is what novel ideas and advice? do each of you have and how we can best use the, the film Homefront, either as a therapeutic tool or as a policy for springboard, given how pow powerful the movie is. 
open to, uh, let's start with you, Tracy, because I think you were you were next in line for, for a comment. Yes, thanks. That's an excellent question. Um, I think we can use the film to really identify what those additional needs are for children. And I mentioned earlier about, you know, the film really highlights the role of a child as a caregiver. And those children, I, I was just so impressed with the way that they interact with their parents and support their parents. And so I, I think we need, in terms of policy or, or things that we can do, we need to develop more programs to acknowledge and support that role that children play as caregiver. Because oftentimes the caregiver role is defined as an adult, except we, we know that we have thousands of children who are serving as caregivers. And one of the things that um, we're planning to do within our network is, is to address that more. And so we're actually gonna be identifying that in our, um, our initial screening process so that we have that knowledge early on and we can help to build on the treatment plan to support those children's specific needs. But so to answer the question, I think screening to really identify and acknowledge and then development of programs to support. Wonderful. Amy, what are your thoughts about the therapeutic or policy value of such a wonderful film? I was actually thinking about like as a therapist, could I imagine having this film in my back pocket and sharing it with a family? Um, absolutely, right? Like here are some families that might be struggling and here are some things that they're doing as a way to kind of normalize, destigmatize, open up a conversation. Um, people are so open to media versus like go read this book or you know this article I'm gonna give you. Cause it, so it could fast track. And then I also like personally think that um, it's it's more engaging and fun. Um, so if I was going to require training of my um, teaching staff or wanted to really like drive this home, take a great, well done piece like this that's short and sweet and emotionally provocative or evocative, um, and use that as a way to get people engaged in the topic. I think um, it could really be helpful. Wonderful. Other panel members. Um, what are your thoughts about um, using the home, leveraging the home front film, um, either as a way to catalyze a conversation or a therapy in some way to move the therapeutic agenda, or also maybe to influence social policy to, to better the um, resources and commitments to, uh, to our active uh, military families? Yeah. Us. I completely agree with Tracy and Amy and, and to what Amy was speaking about, I also could see it clinically as a great tool for maybe a family that's maybe not ready for a support group. You know, some folks that's not where they're at quite yet. And to help them see that they're not alone, I think it could be tremendously impactful. I'm also constantly thinking about, yes, the schools and having teachers and administrators have the opportunity to really appreciate the experience of a military child, um, I think would be, would be wonderful. And yes, we can go provide military cultural competency trainings and those are fun to give and I think have an impact, but a, a well done film like this, as Amy was saying, it's, it's so, it's really fun, it's accessible. Um, so I'd love to be able to get this in front of more teachers as a, an empathy builder, um, so they can more appreciate the challenges of, of children of, of uh, military families. Wonderful, Carl, that's a, that's, that's a great idea to get out, out in front of teachers, not just therapists. Carl, your thoughts about, about uh, the use of film for these secondary, but really powerful, uh, potential change on that. You know, I, I, obviously, you know, Tracy and Amanda and Amy are more creative and innovative than I am in this area. I will say that part to the film made me very sad and, and, and brought almost tears to my eyes because I saw a lot of these children who were caregivers who weren't being allowed to be a child. And, and a child being a caregiver 
I just, I can't even go there because I don't even have the vocabulary to talk about what it's like. I'll be honest, I don't even know, have the vocabulary to talk about it. But, you know, Gabby just made me so, so sad. I, I can't, I can't describe it. It's, it's, she's a child and she's so stressed and so distraught over the health and well-being of her parents. And I can't imagine what that's like. And it really, it, it highlighted a huge gap in our knowledge, our, a huge gap in our support structures for, you know, parents with kids, young, fairly young children who need an opportunity to explore and be a child. And so I'm going to stop there because I don't really have anything constructive to say other than it affected me in a tremendous way that I hadn't anticipated. But it, at the same time, I think highlights a huge, huge gap in knowledge and maybe even in resources. I, I don't know about the resources. I know that that Tracy and Amy and Amanda, you're much more in tune to the resources, but I just, how can we ensure that the children of wounded warriors are still children? Yeah. And they still and, have that opportunity to be a child. Yeah, and they're not robbed of that wonderful opportunity. Well, uh, maybe just, Carl, just to kind of put together a couple of things you said, you said sometimes one of the most powerful things we can do to benefit warfighters and their families is to give them a language for things that are hard to find words for. And that's something that's hard to find words for. The pain we feel when children, uh, because of their family responsibilities, are robbed of the natural, playful freedom to be child, to be children. Maybe a film like this can help at least with a shared language for that and begin to allow other kids in families like that to be able to talk about what that means to them and, and what their unmet needs are. Uh, I, I think from my own experience, um, uh, not in the military context, but civilian with my own children and grandchildren, I had a very recent experience with one of my uh, 12 and a half year old granddaughters asked me to watch a uh, Netflix series with her about a young woman who she really admires. And what this led to over a couple of episodes was that the young woman was beginning to explore a love relationship for the first time as a teenage girl. And that opened up the language and the shared vocabulary for me as her grandfather to be able to talk to her about her sensitive feelings about what she imagined it would be like to form a love relationship at some point in the future. So the film had an enormously catalytic power to be able to talk about something that was too awkward to talk about sort of without, without an indirect oblique reference. So I think film can play that kind of role to start a hard conversation. And I think, I, I think really like Carl, like the emotional response that you have, like, I think there's power in bearing witness and um, it's so healing, not only for the person who is being able to share that it takes, it, it's, it's a sharing then of that sadness. We, we shouldn't shy away from that. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. It's not all flowers and, you know, unicorns. I mean, there are difficult aspects to this, this conversation. And I think we have to to own it and um, and having them the language for kids to be able to go, I identify with that, then can be a, a hopefully some kind of a springboard into action. Wonderful. Uh, sadly, we've come to the point where uh, we have to uh, quickly, Alex reminds me we need to, to wrap up. Uh, uh, final thoughts, Tracy. Uh, so it was, I think it's a great film that really just highlights the resiliency of our, our family members, especially our, the children of military members. Uh, it, and it, it's a great resource to continue to share. Um, I just echo many of the points that my fellow panel members have shared. Um, 
and thank you for, for sharing this stage with me today. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Amanda. Yeah, I think the film uh, was so impactful and really can be used as such a tool in all the populations uh, that we talked about. And I think one area to really highlight is that if if military families are experiencing the kind of disconnection um, that sometimes can occur, um, or if the kids or the family unit need some extra help, it does exist out there. Um, and I think that's really very important. And I appreciate Carl, you, you bringing uh, up all sides of this and all sides of the film really brought up. Um, and so I really encourage folks to, to look into some of the resources that I think Tracy really nicely highlighted here, uh, that there is, there is additional support out there as well. Wonderful. Carl, uh, fascinating panel. What are you, on, on reflection, what are your thoughts all in on, on this film and how we can use it to, to really even do more for our military families? I think the film is a wonderful bridge to having all of these conversations and, that we're having today and, and highly recommend it to anyone who who wants to build those bridges and, and get a, a, a better understanding of what military families, especially uh, servicemen who have been wounded, go through. It's very, very powerful. Wonderful, thanks. Amy, we'll give you the last word. Well, lucky me. I just wanna say a final thank you to the filmmakers as well as the participants who shared their story. That takes a lot of courage um, and we see you. Um, and I just echo everything else that's been said about looking for help, it's out there. There are a lot of people that want to help and want to be there to support these families. So thanks. Well, and I'll just wrap up. Thanks everyone. And thanks uh, Susan and Alex and uh, a special thanks to Marilyn DeLuca for, for inviting us to uh, participate in this panel. Uh, a deep congratulations to Shine Global on your success with this film and your deep ongoing mission to improve the quality of lives and families. And it, it, it was, from my perspective, very moving and uh, not easy, but, but at the same time, very enjoyable to, to share this panel with all of you. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, it, it, I think it will have a deep resonance and influence uh, both the care we give going forward, the research we'll do going forward, and how we can inform public policy. So thank you so much, all of you, for taking time from your very busy schedules and for your uh, not, not just deeply insightful, but heartfelt comments today. Yes, thank you all so much. And uh, to our audience, I just want to remind you that this was recorded. So, and it will still be available along with the film in Eventive through the end of the month. So please share it with any colleagues that weren't able to join us live. Um, we'd love to have them watch the film and be inspired by everything our panelists had to say. Um, and Shine Global also created a companion discussion guide to go along with Homefront. So that's for general audience use. So if you have teachers, uh, you know, your school communities, anybody that might want to engage with the film, that discussion guide is free to download from our website. And the film is streaming on HBO Max. So you can watch it at any time there with a subscription as part of Sesame Workshops through our eyes series. So thank you again, everyone, so much for joining both our panelists and audience. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alex.